chapter 9, verse 27 to 31. And as Jesus passed on from there, wherever he was, <laughs> two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. What would happen if I would change that but to an and? And I would say, and they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Would that change kind of the tenor of it? Would that, would that change it to maybe that uh, maybe they weren't... Uh, it, it sounds antagonistic. Let me read. See that no one knows about it, but they went away. Or see that no one knows about it, and they went away and spread his fame throughout that district. Do you think there's a little bit of a difference there? Do you think about that? Put that in the back of your mind. Well, I got a little pain right there. Put it back here. I'll put it back here in mind. You put it somewhere in yours, and, and let that be settled there in the back of your mind as we go through this lesson. We'll talk about it there in a little bit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What if we're not merciful? receive mercy if we're not merciful, will we? Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus admonished the Pharisees, saying, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. There you have a group of people, the Pharisees, who were not merciful, and Jesus said, You better go and learn about mercy if you want to be what? Saved. Wait a minute, they're Pharisees. They're the cream of the crop. They're, they're, well, they thought they were the cream of the crop. They were self-righteous, weren't they? But something was wrong in their understanding about mercy. So, as we come into this lesson today, it's not a coincidence that Jesus is talking about, because it is Matthew chapter 9, right? Uh, Jesus, uh, Matthew's telling us something about mercy. He's talking about mercy and how disciples uh, come to Jesus seeking mercy, begging mercy from Jesus, but there are conditions placed upon us as we seek out the mercy of God. Mercy is one of the major themes that Jesus talks about in the Bible. It was one of the major themes of the Old Testament, but it wasn't a major theme for the Pharisees. It wasn't a major theme for many of the Jews. That's kind of the one they put on the back burner. You know, that happens today in, in religion, does it? In Christianity, there are some things that religious groups will put on the back burner. We don't really want to talk about that. We, we won't talk about that. We, uh, we'll talk about other stuff. We want to emphasize this. We don't want to emphasize this. Well, why don't you want to emphasize this? Well, people don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about this stuff that people want to talk about. What people are interested in. People need to be interested in the fullness of God's Word. Everything about God's Word, because everything about it is important. So they need to understand about mercy. But they had, and especially the Pharisees, had distorted God's word to the point where they just didn't care. So they failed to comprehend their need, first of all, to beg for the mercy of God. We don't like to beg, do we? We think we're pretty self-sufficient. Modern day America, right? We don't need anything. I've got me, and, and, and in fact, that's what we, that everybody tries to, to kind of push out. You don't need anything. You, you, you got yourself. You are important and everything, blah, blah, blah. Boy, that's kind of destroyed society has to, this 
me first selfishness that's out here. Uh, I'm just as important as everybody else. Well, to a degree, yes, but we as human beings just aren't that important. <laughs> I'm sorry. When in relationship to God, we are totally dependent upon God. Now, in this fallen world, Satan gets us to thinking that, that we are gods and we're in control and we're not, so we got to be careful. So first of all, we have to beg for mercy. Secondly, we have to extend mercy to others. So our passage today that's under consideration teaches us a very important lesson about following Jesus. Number one, faith opens our eyes to the mercy of God. It tells us, I need his mercy. It's he whom I have sinned against, when I say he, God the Father, predominantly, but actually Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And but it opens our mouths to his glory. But it opens our mouths to his glory in a particular way. And I think that's going to be pointed out in, in this lesson that, that in ways that, that we probably maybe haven't seen it before. And I know that there's a lot of people out here in the world that haven't seen it because I, I, I know that, I, and I, I put that in the religious world, because they approach things in a different way than what Jesus was having these two blind men approach it. So when the two blind men first approach Jesus, what are they doing? They're begging for mercy. They're begging for mercy. Because mercy is not something that God just automatically gives, right? We have to recognize our need for mercy. Hey, there, there are a lot of people out here who, who, for some reason, somebody has convinced them that because Jesus died upon the cross, they don't have to do anything. They're called universalists. Remember, we talked about Unitarian people who believe that God is just one and has a split personality, uh, shows up sometimes as the Father, sometimes as the Son, sometimes as the, the Holy Spirit. Well, there's also another group that typically goes along with them, that's the Universalists. And if you do some study, you read about the Univer uh, Unitarian Universalist Church. Remember, uh, what, about a year ago, there's a person that came out and said there is no such thing as hell? Remember that? Preacher come out, he was a famous preacher, and boy, his, his denomination just got on to him you know, what are you talking about? There is no hell. We've preached about hell, and it's a part of our denomination. It's a part of our creed, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And basically, they were running out of their denomination. And you know where he went to? To the Unitarian Universalist. Because I watched the movie just not too long ago about this guy's life. And at the end of the movie, it says he's preaching for the Unitarian Universalist Church. What does that mean? Well, I told you what Unitarian means. This universalist means that nobody's going to hell because there isn't any hell. Everybody's going to be saved in the end. And he twists some scriptures. He twists some Bible scriptures to get people to believe that. Well, if that's the case, nobody needs any mercy. We've got to recognize we need mercy, and the way we get mercy is to beg for mercy. Remember, grace and mercy are not the same thing. Grace is giving a blessing we do not deserve, and the great example, the atonement of Christ leading to our forgiveness. Jesus dying upon the cross was totally God's deal. God did that. There was nothing we could do to bring that about. We sinned, but that was God's plan. This was totally an unmerited gift from God. Right? Mercy's not getting the punishment that we deserve. So it's not an unmerited gift from God. It's a gift that comes with conditions. We have to beg for it to receive it, but there are conditions applied to it. So the grace of God is freely given, but the mercy of God is a response to our petitioning the ultimate judge of the universe, the ultimate judge of men's souls, for it. For it. That's why these two blind men had to come to Jesus and say, be merciful unto us. Because they had to ask for it. That's a condition. 
If we don't ask for God's mercy, are we going to receive it? No, because we're making our own selves God. I deserve, I deserve this, I deserve this. God is unfair because he isn't doing this for me. Maybe the problem isn't God. Maybe the problem's me. And maybe it's not even a problem. Maybe I'm wanting the wrong thing. Maybe I'm not asking God for the right thing. Just asking God for mercy doesn't mean that we will receive it. Say, Romans 9, 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God says, don't tell me what I have to do. There are a lot of people that try to tell God what, what God needs to do. How God ought to be, what God needs to do to be fair. It, it, it's wrong for God to say that a certain thing is sin. How, how could God say that that is sin? God must not be compassionate because he says that is sin. God made me this way. No, God didn't make me that way. And God has the right to call sin whatever he calls sin. And we have to adjust to God. God doesn't adjust to us. We adjust to God. So God said, I have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I have compassion on whom I have compassion. That, that's the way it's supposed to be. Because we are the underlings. God is the one who's in control. And, and see... We talk about God creating this universe. He created it good. We're the ones that went bad. God's not the one who broke covenant. We're the ones who broke covenant. We're the ones who walked away. We're the ones in rebellion. So then what are some of the conditions of receiving God's mercy? It's conditioned on our willingness, number one, to be merciful. And we talked about that, didn't we, earlier in the introduction. If we're not willing to be merciful, don't expect mercy from God. Okay? Now, how far does that extend? I can be plenty merciful, but you know there are some things that I can't change. You know, uh, just like, okay, yeah, this is a, a, a tough little thing. I can forgive the guy that killed my mother. He's still going to spend some time in prison because he's got to pay for what he did. So I can forgive him. I said, you know, hey, the court system is the one who's taking justice there. That's the way it is. And if he ever repents and turns to God, he can go to heaven. I wouldn't keep him out of heaven if, 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 that's, if that's what he does. You know, that's all right. Because okay? that's going to be between him and God. And my being merciful in that sense is Right? That's between me and God. And that's the way it kind of works there. So that's that being merciful. Secondly, it's conditioned on our willingness to repent. Repent. If we're not going to repent toward God, He's not going to be merciful to us. We can ask God all day long for stuff. He's, well, what are you going to do for me? Are you going to change? Are you going to, are you going to come along to my side? You know, again, we're in rebellion when we're walking in sin. Are we going to get on God's side so it'll be merciful? Listen to this, Numbers 14, verse 17 and 19. And now, please, let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And again, that's that mercy, isn't it? Forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation, Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Lord, if they repent, forgive them and be merciful unto them. If they repent, if they fail to repent, there's nothing. If God doesn't have to be merciful if we don't repent. If we're still going to work against Him and against His kingdom here on the earth, why in the word will he be merciful to us? Doesn't make any sense. And we'll see that more as we get into dealing with these two blind men. Number three, it's conditioned on our commitment to obey God. Second Chronicles 6.14. 
uh, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love, again, that's that mercy, to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. That's a condition of receiving God's mercy. Do we have the heart to obey God? If we don't have a heart to obey God, see, sometimes people want mercy because they got a sickness, uh, they got a financial problem, they got something going on, and oh God, be merciful to me, and then when the problem's over, it's kind of like, thank you God, and they go back. Yeah, you know, it's like the guy I talk about, you know, he falls over the cliff, oh God, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you forever, and he reaches out his hand, he grabs a root sticking out of the cliff, Oh, never mind, God, I got it now. <laughs> yeah, it's like the crisis is over. I can go back to my rebellion against God. God won't be played like a fool. He just won't. Uh, number four, it's conditioned on our realization of needing it. Psalm 25, 16, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. That's what David is saying. That God, you turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. I need you. I need you, God. Do we really realize how much we need God in this life? Number five, it's conditioned on our pursuit of the truth. Psalm 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. If that's the throne that God sits on, steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Hey, that's what he expects of us, isn't it? Righteousness, justice, steadfast love, that's that mercy once again, and faithfulness, that's what he wants us, but you know the greatest, the greatest condition for our receiving mercy, not the only condition, but the greatest condition, number six, is faith. Is faith. So we must recognize God's authority and ability to give mercy. The two blind men called Jesus son of David. You know what? That's why like code words for Messiah. That's what we call the Christ. You know, the anointed one, uh, that's what Messiah and Christ both mean, the anointed one. One's Hebrew, one's Greek. So they recognize him as Messiah. They had heard of Jesus, how he was able to heal people. They heard about his message. They believed that he was the Messiah. Jesus at first, you know, kind of typical of Jesus in many ways. What's he do at first? He ignores them. He's walking along with his disciples and they're following along. Son of David, be merciful to us. He just kind of ignores them. Walks along, walks into the house. But you know what they do? They follow him into the house. Don't they? Jesus, be merciful to us. Son of David, be merciful unto us. They follow him into the house. Jesus may have thought they really didn't believe. They just, they just, you know, there are some people who use the name of Jesus like a magical incantation. If, if I wish for something and say in the name of Jesus, I might get it. And that's not what in the name of Jesus means. It means that we really believe and, and we are doing our best to fulfill His will here upon the earth. They weren't simply calling him son of David in order to be healed. Yes, they wanted their blindness gone, but they were saying they believed that he was the Messiah. So he asked them, do you really believe that I am able to do this? Because, you know, again, that's part of the prophecy. The, the blind shall receive their sight through this Messiah. Yes, they say. Their persistence coupled with their answer demonstrated their faith. But the true measure of their faith was in the measure of their healing. How do you know that? Look at here. According to your faith, let it be to you. How about that? 
you go to heaven, if I go to heaven, it's going to be according to our faith. It's not going to be about the power of God, is it? It's going to be about according to how much we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because if we believe that, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do all those things, those conditional things that I talked about just a moment ago. Our lives are going to be changed. Our lives are going to be different. We're going to be a different people. We're going to be that new creation. Yes. Because we believe it. We can't do anything but be a different people than what we were when we were in rebellion to God. We're no longer going to be in rebellion. We're going to be part of the kingdom. We're going to be part of the Lord's army. Without genuine faith, they would have gone away blind. He, he could have healed them. He, he, he could have given them sight and they'd still gone away blind, right? Without genuine faith. Because it had been spiritually blind. Jesus is merciful. In other words, he forgives and he saves according to faith. He requires a faith that truly believes he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In fact, you know, when, when, when somebody comes forward, and I know we don't really do it like, you know, we ask, you know, if anybody has a need, let them, you know, let them request be made. No, you know, lots of times we say, you know, come forward or whatever. But one of the things we ask before we baptize somebody is, you know, make the confession. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Now, if they really believe that, they say they believe that, we'll baptize them. But we don't know if they really believe it or not. That's between them and God, and God's going to be the one to make the decision. We'll see the physical effects of it, and that they're baptized. But see, if they say, no, I don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I just want to be baptized because uh, my wife wants me to, or my husband wants me to, or my mom wants me to, or... No, uh, that's not a good reason to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It requires faith that He is the Christ, so that's why it's very important to be knowledgeable of that. So He requires a faith that truly wants to be, uh, that truly believes that sin condemns, right? A faith that wants forgiveness of sins. You know, sometimes we want to just make ourselves feel good, but wants the forgiveness of the sin. I don't want that on my conscience anymore. And then Peter talks about, you know, a clean conscience. You know, the baptism leads to a clean conscience. Now, that's a clean conscience with God. God wipes it out, all right? I, I still got to deal with the person I sinned against. I mean, that takes a lot longer. And sometimes it takes a lot longer to deal with self, right? I got to forgive myself. Faith, a faith willing to obey to obey God, to obey His commandments, to have sins forgiven, number one, ha, you know, arrive, uh, uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's a big one right there. Only this to obey. Uh, and He requires a faith truly willing to follow Him anywhere He directs. To follow Him, that's what discipleship is follow him. And it's not like he says, hey, come with me, I want to go to China. No, it's follow him, follow his lead into those things. Just just go back to and one of these days, see when we get through a lot of this stuff in Matthew, we'll go back to Matthew chapter 5 verses, uh, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, look at the Sermon on the Mount and see where he's leading us in our everyday life. That makes sense. Without genuine faith, people die in their sins and are condemned for eternity. <coughs> got my keyboard up there for some reason. And that's what Jesus is saying. According to your faith, live be to you. What's your faith like? Do you really believe that Jesus is the Christ and Son of the Holy God? If you do, you don't do what he says you do. When the mercy of God enters our lives, our purpose in life changes. It changes. They went from begging for mercy, 
son of David, have mercy on us, to spreading the news about him. See how, see how the change took place? Son of David, have mercy on us, and then the change takes place in their lives because they are under covenant relationship with him as Jews. Now, as disciples, there's a change that takes place. And what do they do? They go spreading the news about him. They went everywhere, didn't they? Did they disobey Jesus? Remember, I asked you to keep that in the back of your mind there. Bring that up here later on. Matthew 9, 30. The last part of that. And Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. Who knows about what? knows about what? What just happened? The miracle, the miracle. See that no one knows about the miracle that you received your sight. Wait a minute. Everybody there knows that they went in the house blind and they come out with their sight. They're going to know, right? They don't have to tell anybody, do they? It's going to be known. I think there was something a little bit different here. This is something that I have dealt with. Back when I was in prison, ministry, <laughs> after a couple of years, I, I had guys that hung around in my class for a long time. It was Fred. Uh, that, well, first of all, a lot of them wanted to give their testimony. You want to give your testimony, you can do that wherever. We're here for Bible class. You find it. You, you don't do it. You're not like that. They let us do this. That's not what I would. Give us your testimony. I won't give you my testimony because I don't believe in that. I'll tell you how I became a Christian. I went back and showed them the gospel. You know, how it, but as we talked about it, you know, here, here's one of those perfect examples here. What is Jesus telling these two blind men? It's not... Hey, don't tell anybody. Just go on your way and pretend that nothing happened. Everybody's going to see. These guys were blind. Now they can see. But what does he tell? And he tells them, don't go out and tell people about this. And that's why I say, change that what to an and. And you get a different story. They go out and they spread the news about him. It's not about me. It's not about what Jesus did to me. It's not about me getting my sight. Look at me. I was blind and now I can see. Look at me. Look at me. It's about Messiah's here. Get ready. The Messiah's coming. The Messiah. Be prepared. He's coming to our this village. He's coming next. That's what every disciple was doing. Go back and read. When Jesus sent out the seven, excuse me, <coughs> what were they doing? They would go to all the villages. And they would do some things. They would do some miracles. They'd say, Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. Listen to this. They simply preached the gospel. The Messiah has come. And they called others to come and meet Jesus. They were doing nothing more than what the what disciples are supposed to do. They weren't calling attention to themselves. They weren't talking about the miracle. Talking about Jesus. So there. Faith opens our eyes to the mercy of God and our mouths to is glory. And there are a lot of people out here that like to talk about their own glory. And they like, like to talk about what God has done for them, but what they need to do is start talking about Jesus and what Jesus can do. About salvation being in Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, this is to his apostles, and if it's Second to the apostles, it's 
coming to us also, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go and make disciples of all nations. If you go on over to Mark 16, 15, 16. The old King James says, go and teach all nations, say, but go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? First Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That proves that he is the Messiah, the one who was sent to save, the one who would take the ones who are in rebellion and based upon their faith would have mercy on them and forgive their sins when they obeyed the gospel by repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and that being buried with him in baptism, they would rise to walk in newness of life children of God, not children of rebellion, not children of the devil, children of God. What a wonderful thing to be called, the children of God. Amen. That's the invitation that we offer. Every time we come together, and the invitation is there, let's make sure that our message is the message that Jesus gives us. Blessings. If you have a need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitations.